Well, hello, everyone, and um, welcome to another round of lectures here. Uh, let me just, uh, well, first of all, I'm taping this on Sunday. This is a Sunday afternoon, April 19th, and this is a very big day in American history. 245 years ago today, April 19th, 1775, the American Revolution began with the shot heard round the world Fired at Lexington, uh, followed by the Battle of Concord on the morning of the 19th of April, uh, driving the British back to Boston. Unfortunately, on this day, in April 19th, 25 years ago, 1995, your parents would probably remember this, a, or they should remember it. I mean, Timothy McVeigh, who was a disgruntled soldier who was did not like the U.S. government, uh, loaded a truck with explosives uh, and detonated this truck bomb outside of the Mira Federal Building in downtown Oklahoma City, killing a bunch of innocent people, uh, leaving a huge crater. Uh, he did that in response to what the government did, had done two years earlier, on April 19th, 1993, 27 years ago today. A group called the Branch Davidians had barricaded themselves in their complex outside Waco, and I think it was a 58-day standoff. Tanks rolled in to spray nerve gas. The building ignited, and over 100 people lost their lives, including, I believe, 15 children, uh, under the guise of a cult leader named David Koresh, who had convinced these people that he was the Messiah, but they also had a stash of guns. But um, uh, infamous and famous day in American history. And if you go back and look at things, uh, it's amazing what people will follow, even here in recent history. Uh, if you're interested, you don't have to do this, but if you're interested, Go back and look at, uh, just Google Jim Jones in Jonestown. It was 19, 1979, I believe it was. A pastor, or he claimed to be a pastor in California, convinced almost a thousand people to follow him to his promised land in what is now French Guiana in South America, uh, where basically he'll end up imprisoning them. So have them isolated and trapped and concerned family members start to inquire. A congressman named uh, Leo Ryan goes down to investigate and they murder him. And Jim Jones knows that you can't murder a congressman and get away with that. So he convinces all these people to commit suicide. If you've ever heard the term, some people commit suicide. It says my connection is unstable. Hang on. Oh, give it a second here. It's, all right, there we go. Uh, a guy named Father Raw Doe was convinced that this comet that was coming by Earth called the Hellbot Comet had a spaceship on the other side of it that was could carry the select few uh, to eternal bliss uh, exploring the heavens. But to do that, you had the with purple blankets wearing Nike shoes. They had a specific thing that they had to wear. Google that and look at that too. It's just, it's amazing what people will follow. But uh, Jesus said, there will be many that will come in my name, uh, misleading many, and don't follow them, stay the course and always follow truth. Uh, what we're going to be covering today is we're going to we're going to take today, Tuesday and Wednesday, and we're going to finish the chapter 10 study guide. And then you will test over chapter 10 this Friday. Now, normally we don't Zoom on Thursday because that's foreign language. But I've set up uh, two separate Zoom meetings, one for pre-AP and one for you guys. Uh, if you want, if you need help on Thursday for a review, I've set up and you'll you have that link. You'll see it there for three o'clock. Thursday, April 23rd, uh, that if you have questions, I'll be on there. You can jump on and review. I don't have the exact format of the test yet. I've got to get with Mr. Garcia because this is different, obviously, doing this through um, Zoom, but I will get that on there. So, again, this week looks Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You'll be watching a 15- to 20-minute lecture each day and filling out your packet after you've watched it uh, or pause and fill out and move through. And then that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 3 o'clock. There'll be a, a Zoom time for you guys, U.S. History Month. And if you, again, have questions, and then Friday, you'll test over Chapter 10. So that's what the week looks like. And you have links to all that information in your Google Classroom. So get your packages out, and let's look at this sheet right here that says Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Stephen Douglas of Illinois. And that's the page we're going to do today. Stephen Douglas was an aspiring senator from the state of Illinois. Stephen Douglas wanted to be president of the United States. Uh, but to be president of the United States, you have to do something spectacular, something either you're a war hero or you pass some piece of legislation that distinguishes yourself from all other politicians. 
And what he's going to do is even though he's going to author or he's going to put forward a bill that you see there, that second topic there, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Now, what we're talking about here is the Kansas-Nebraska Territory. It's what's left of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so what is now present-day Kansas, uh, North and South Dakota, that region there, uh, up to the Canadian border. And what Stephen Douglas wants to do, being from Illinois, he wants to make Chicago a thriving port in town. Well, you have a port on the on Lake Michigan there, obviously, but he wants to connect Chicago with the west coast of the United States because California has now is now a part of the Union. Uh, it's obvious the manifest destiny of the United States as a coast to coast nation has been complete. But there's a lot of territories still to be determined uh, for statehood and what that looks like. And so he figures if I can get a rail built, a railroad built from Chicago to the west coast of the United States, linking up San Francisco or what will become Los Angeles. If I can get a rail built that will link those west coast cities with the city of Chicago, Chicago becomes a very viable uh, city because cities that are port cities do well. And you look at our nation, still the largest cities are in some type of navigable waterway. Dallas Fort Worth is unique and it's the largest city in the United States on a non-navigable waterway. But in a sense, we have our own port, and that's DFW Airport uh, right here uh, in, in the Metroplex that serves as a port through the air instead of the water. But in 1854, obviously, flights didn't exist yet, so but railroads were expanding. Uh, it would be another 15 years before we would finally link up in 1869 at Promontory Point. But in 1854, Stephen Douglas doesn't know that. And he wants to get the funding through Congress to build a train, I mean, a railroad from Chicago to the West Coast of the United States. The problem is, is he's a senator from Illinois. If I'm a senator from Georgia or South Carolina or Alabama, Mississippi, what's in it for me to support this bill? I got to have something. Why should I give you, Stephen Douglas, funding uh, for you to build your railroad? Uh, there's got to be something in it for me. That's, that's how politics works. And so Stephen Douglas crafts this bill here that you see, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So if I'm a Southern Senator or a Southern Congressman, what do you think the number one thing I want? I want the expansion of slavery in these new territories that have part. The problem is that if you look at the map, you go back to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the 36 degree 30 minute line, which is the Missouri Arkansas border, and is now the border of the top of Texas in the panhandle, slavery cannot exist above that line. It can exist below that line, but not above that line. And so if I was Southern Senator, it's like, well, that doesn't do me any good. And so what this bill does, one of the things that this bill does is for Douglas to get the support, he has to make concessions to the South for them to get their funding. And so what this bill does two things. It, re it repeals the Missouri Compromise. So for 34 years, the Missouri Compromise has been in place from 1820 up through 1854, slavery could not exist above the 36 degree, 30 minute line. But with this act, the Missouri Compromise is repealed. And so now that imaginary line is gone. And point two of this is the next topic you see there, popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty will now decide the slave question in what's left of the Louisiana Territory, i.e. the Kansas, Nebraska Territory. Now, a lot of abolitionists at North see this as a betrayal and a sellout on the part of Stephen Douglas of Illinois, but Stephen Douglas is concerned about being elected president of the United States. That's what he wants to be. And again, to get this massive piece of legislation passed, he has to have sudden support. And to get funding, which is what this bill will do, it will fund a railroad be constructed from Chicago to the West Coast of the United States. To get that concession, to get Southern support for the bill, he has to make concessions. And those are the two. So you have Stephen Douglas will get his funding for his railroad. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 is repealed and is no longer in effect, which means now that you see the third term there, popular sovereignty will decide the slave question in the Kansas-Nebraska territory and what's left of the Louisiana territory. Popular sovereignty is simply this, the majority rules. So, for example, at our school, when you have – well, a student congress, if people get elected to student congress or offices, it's whoever gets the most votes wins. That's popular sovereignty. And so they're going to let the people in these territories decide uh, who, if they want slavery or not. 
but that's going to lead to some problems. It always does. And if you look at the next term there, the term bleeding Kansas. So once this bill was passed in 1854, it's uh, there's these territories settle in. There's going to be a vote that's going to take place in 1856 in on the eastern edge of Kansas. It borders Missouri. And Missouri was a pro-slave state. If you remember the Compromise of 1820, that was one of the conditions that Missouri would be allowed to enter the Union as a slave state. Maine came in as free, and so you still had the balance of 24. Uh, you had still had the balance where it was even in the Senate with 24 pro-slave and 24 anti-slave senators in 1820. This is in Kansas, and so what they're going to do is what bleeding Kansas was, and they were called. Missouri border ruffians, tough guys. And what they would do is they would cross the border into Kansas. They may, and I'm being very simplistic here, maybe knock on a cabin door and say, you guys are pro-slave or are you anti-slave? They said anti-slave. They, they might slap them around a little bit. Or they might say, mm, be ashamed for your barn to uh, burn down tonight. Or be ashamed for your livestock to be run off. And so pro-slave Missouri persons were coming into Kansas and intimidating the people of Kansas to get them to vote for pro-slave. Well, this doesn't set well with a lot of people who are independent things like, who are you to come into my state or the state, this impending state, and tell me how to vote and you're going to intimidate me. That's not the American way. And that's not, that's not what we do. And so you're going to have fights that are going to break out. Hence the term bleeding Kansas, because blood is going to be shed. And you're going to have several incidents that spark conflict here in Kansas that, again, I told you the 1850s is the decade that really accelerates us towards civil war. Going all the way back, remember, to the Compromise of 1850 and the, and the Fugitive Slave Act uh, and the controversy of that, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, in 1852, which exposes uh, the horrors of slavery. And now the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, where what sh which should have been free territory is now open to slavery. And now and beating people up in Kansas uh, and people fighting back in Kansas over the slavery issue. Look at your next topic there, and you're going to see May 21st, 1856. Poor Lawrence, Kansas, home to... Uh, on May 21st, 1856, pro-slave ruffians are going to ride into Lawrence, pistol whip a lot of the residents there, but then burn the town of Lawrence down to the ground. Uh, hold on a minute here, it says, it's trying to reconnect. So I'm going to hold off a second. It may be taping me. It may not, but I'm watching this. It's not, there we go. It says, now I'm back on here. So what's going to happen is, is that these are, they're going to come in. They're going to burn the town down and pistol whip a bunch of people. And poor Lawrence, this is 1856. They're going to rebuild the town. And in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, a group of called Quantrill's Raiders out of Missouri are going to come in and they're going to burn it down again. Uh, some of Quantrill's Raiders will go on to be famous, uh, Frank and Jesse James, and the mythical Rooster Cogburn uh, from the uh, oh, True Grit with John Wayne and also uh, in those movies there. But uh, Quantrill will burn Lawrence down to the ground again in 1863. Not a good, not a good time for Lawrence, Kansas. So what's going to happen here is you're going to have other people on the other side that are anti-slavery that see themselves like this is not fair. And if you look at your next topic there, you've got the avenging hand of God. Uh, a guy named John Brown, who's going to believe, he's going to believe that God, he is God's instrument here on earth to take revenge. Even though it's vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. John Brown is saying, that's me, and I'm going to make you pay. And so in retaliation for the burning of Lawrence, Kansas, and on May 21st, 1856, just three days later, uh, John Brown is going to ride into a pro-slave camp in Camden at a place called Pottawatomie Creek. It's on the Kansas-Missouri uh, border. Now, these people that were at this pro-slave encampment in Pottawatomie Creek had nothing to do with the burning of Lawrence, Kansas, but that doesn't matter to John Brown. John Brown's like, well, I am the avenging hand of God. He and his five sons will ride into this camp, and they will grab, well, they'll, arrest isn't the right word, but seize five men in this camp and proceed to execute them in front of their families and friends there, uh, at this place called Pottawatomie Creek, and hence the term Pottawatomie Creek Massacre. So things are spinning out of control very quickly in Kansas, as you see there. And so now you have the town of Lawrence burned, and then three days later, it was by, by pro-slave people. Three days later, on May 24th, 1856, you have five pro-slave people that had nothing to do with the burning of Lawrence murdered by John Brown. But And John Brown is going to have, obviously, 
warrants issued for his arrest. He's going to scatter and he's going to disappear from the scene, but we'll see him later in the chapter. He'll show back up three years later in 1859, but we'll get to that. One of John Brown's sons is captured, charged with murder and hang, uh, but this sows the seeds of discontent between pro-slave and anti-slave. And again, the, going back to the term, bleeding Kansas, the violence that came out of that. In 1856, which is the next thing you see there, the election of 1856, we're gonna have a presidential election. And Franklin Pierce, who had won the election of 1852, is not going to be nominated by his own party. But you're going to have a new Republican Party that is formed that is an anti-slave-based organization. And they're going to put a guy named John Fremont. Uh, John Fremont uh, was known as the Pathfinder. Uh, he found a way to get to California on a trail. He's a trailblazer uh, in the Bay Area. You have a town named Fremont, California, named after him. But he's going to run. Uh, but in the end, James B. the 15th president of the United States. But what that does, the, the, Rep the new Republican Party is going to come onto the stage in a very powerful way, uh, which, in, which will be a huge uh, factor four years later in the election of 1860 that we'll get to later. Now, James Buchanan is a unique person. He's the only president in our nation's history uh, that was not married. He was a single guy. Uh, there's questions about him, but who knows, who cares? But he becomes the 15th president of the United States in a very tumultuous time because it's going to start to spin rapidly out of control. And for him, unfortunately, he's not the right guy at this time to handle it, but we'll, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, another landmark decision here that you see, the Dred Scott decision of 1857. Now, who Dred Scott was, was he was a, he was a slave, he and his wife Harriet. And they had been purchased in Missouri by an army colonel. And this army colonel uh, treated them, well, slavery, slavery, but had treated them nice. But he was actually living uh, at a post in Minnesota when he will die suddenly. And he dies in 1848. And this is prior to the Compromise of 1815, the Fugitive Slave Law. So what happens is, being that Dred Scott is property, he should have been handed off to an heir or been uh, something that would have been inherited by somebody. But he didn't have any family. And so Dred Scott and his wife Harriet are free because they're living on free soil uh, when, when this happened. Well, that would have been nice for most people, but not for Dred Scott. He's like, no, I want to be free. I want to be free everywhere, not just free in Minnesota or free north of the Ohio River. And Dred Scott will actually go back to Missouri and petition for his freedom, for he and his wife, Harriet. And this case will take nine years to work its way up through the court system. I mean, it was a question of, well, if he's property and there was nobody to claim that he was on free soil, then he should be free. But if he was a slave, how does he become free for the simple fact that the guy who owned him died and that and not left him over there? So therefore, is he free or not? And it's a, it's a landmark case because it was a question of where does the law apply and how does it apply evenly? In the end, in the end, the court found against him. In fact, it was the justice, chief justice who wrote the decision, the Dred Scott decision, a guy named Roger Taney. If you remember Roger Taney, Roger Taney had been the secretary of, or the, had been the secretary of the treasury under, I mean, had been the attorney general under Andrew Jackson. And remember that Andrew Jackson wanted to kill the Bank of the United States, and the first Secretary of Treasury wouldn't do that. And he appointed Roger Taney, he said, if you'll empty the Bank of the United States and put my small, small pet banks in my choosing, I'll nominate you for Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So here we are 21 years later, uh, after Jackson put Taney on the courts, he's been the Chief Justice for 21 years, and he's going to write the landmark decision saying that because Roger Taney had returned to a slave state, he was a slave. And it, it, to be very simplistic here, had he stayed in Minnesota, nobody would have come looking for him. Uh, and he would have been free in Minnesota because he was free. Uh, he wasn't a runaway. He wasn't a fugitive. So the fugitive, the fugitive slave law of 1850 would not have applied to him. But he said he, had, he wanted to be free everywhere. And what this case showed was, now think about this. So if Roger Tony stays in Minnesota, he's free. But if he, but because he goes to Minnesota, he goes back to Missouri to sue for his freedom, he returns to an institution of slavery. And so the fallacy of the decision is, is that the law of the land does not apply equally everywhere. The 
the law of the land should be the law of the land. If it's if under federal law, what's illegal in Washington state should be illegal in Florida. Not just because where I am geographically. I hope this makes sense. So the fallacy of it was it exposed the hypocrisy of the law here that that you if you're free in the United States, you're free. And it's not where you are geographically when it comes to the law. The law of the land should apply everywhere equally uh, and without prejudice. But that's what this that's what the Dred Scott decision uh, exposed. OK, so that's a good place to stop. So you've listened to this. You can go back and fill your study packet. There'll be another one of these that comes on Tuesday, and we'll finish Wednesday. And again, reminding you that we will test, I mean, we'll review on Thursday at 3 o'clock. You should have a link in your Google Classroom uh, for uh, to join the Zoom meeting if you want to. If you have questions on the review, we can go over the format of the test. And then you'll test, you'll test on Friday. And again, I don't know exactly what that format looks like yet. I've got to talk to Mr. Garcia and see exactly who's the history department chair and see, okay, because this is new for all of us, uh, throwing and rolling out a test online in, in in this way. So we're all learning. I'm learning. Uh, anyway, there we are. Uh, though, just on a personal note, it's uh, I've always enjoyed what I do, and I especially enjoy being around all of you in the classroom and seeing you. This has made me appreciate it so much more that uh, – uh, just just the interaction, being able to see your face and uh, join me on Zoom. If you have questions or you just want to chit-chat, that's what we're there for. So have a great rest of your day, and we'll...